So tell me about this, like how you got into it. I mean, what was the beginning of getting to know Wayne and why you wanted to make a movie with him? The beginning was, was meeting Wayne 12 years ago. He tells the story better than I do because he gets to make fun of me. But um, I was an intern at a design studio, and he was drawing these Priceline commercials. And I found out what he had done, that he worked on Pee Wee's Playhouse, and he worked on Beekman's World. And anyone my age is, is hugely impacted by those shows and what he had done. And um, like I said, that was 12 years ago. And I always had it in my head that he'd make this great story, because beyond the, the, the resume, he's got this incredible personality that you'll meet, and he's got a really great family and he's really funny and cool and he has a beard and plays banjo and I was like why is anyone making a movie about this guy and so eventually it started to get to where I might have the means to actually do that on my own so I stopped talking about it and kind of kept it a secret and then one day I went to Sammy's camera in LA and bought a $600 camcorder and flew to Houston and started shooting Wow, and uh, I mean, the other thing that I think is amazing is this is your first like documentary, and um, I mean, these guys really collaborated on this, as you'll see, and get to know as you get to know their story a little bit. I mean, it's it's just a really great story. So, it actually opens tomorrow. It opens tomorrow at uh, IFC Center here in Soho, just around the corner. Yeah, awesome. In Los Angeles and Seattle, but you can all tell your friends, and you can all go see it tomorrow night. And uh, Wayne and I will be there at the 6.30, sorry, Friday night, Friday night, Friday night, not September 7th. And Wayne and I will be there at the 6.30, 8.30, and 10.30 shows to do Q&A afterwards. All right, the man, Wayne Wright. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. So, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Joel, for hosting this wonderful yeah. event. It's a pleasure. I yes. love it. Should uh, we get, what do you want to do? Do you want to talk for a while or let people ask questions? Yeah, please be quiet. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, the one thing we all share as human beings, we all want our story told, you know? And I was lucky enough to have my story told in one of the most powerful art forms there is, the cinema, you know? I think movies and music are the quickest way to the human heart. And it's so great to be showing my story around the country and now in the greatest city in the world and having people respond to it and just uh, having people get off on it, you know, be inspired. Uh, it's, just, it's a story for everybody, but specifically it's a story for creative people. And I'm sure a lot of you people here tonight are creative types, artists, or trying to do something, trying to create some sort of imagery or some sort of object or some sort of computer thing or something, anything. And it's really for you. It's about, well, it's about perseverance, number one. You know, never give up, even if the days get dark or whatever. And uh, it's also about just uh, following your heart. It's about having the audacity to do what you love. Because let's face it, the world does not want you to do what you love. The world wants to, to put you in a box, put you in a system, make you play it safe, have common sense, and don't take risks. And the movie is all about telling you to take risks, don't have common sense, follow your stupid whims of your heart, no matter how silly they are. And uh, I hope that gets across in the movie. Awesome. Uh, so be stupid? <laughs> be yeah, stupid. Right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. If you love being stupid, find a way to do it, you know? You know what the world needs? The world, if you put something out there that you do that you love, people are going to pick up on it, and people are going to pay you for it. The world craves that kind of vibe. The world craves that kind of passion. You know, when I started doing these crazy puppet shows uh, in college, people thought I was insane, you know, these do-it-yourself punk rock puppet shows back in the late 70s and early 80s. And when I first moved to New York in the East Village, I kept doing them. And people would go, Wayne, find a vocation. Do something sensible. You know, concentrate on something that's going to make you money. Quit doing these these crazy puppet shows. But lo and behold, the thing that I love the most, these crazy shows, led to the thing that made me the most money, gave me the greatest job in the world on Pee Wee's Playhouse, uh, gave me an income that let me buy a house and raise two kids. And it was all because I kept to my guns on that. So that's one of the messages of the movie also. Do we go to questions now? I feel like we should. Does anybody have a question? 
We have a microphone. Just raise your hand and we'll come to you. Yeah, there's somebody. Wayne, how do you feel about Todd Oldham stealing your beard? <laughs> hey, I just was at Todd's just now down on v Vasey Street. And uh, we sort of mutually grew them at the same time, you know. It was kind of a, a brothers of the beard kind of thing. So I don't mind. Let's all grow beards. Come on, let's start a trend. Bearded ladies, I'd like to see that. Let's do another clip. Well, I mean, a big part of the movie and, and, and Wayne's life is, and why I was so inspired to do it, is he's this guy that gets up every day and just makes and creates. And whether he has something to do for a job or just, just on his own, he gets up and you can't sit with him for five minutes without him picking up a pencil and drawing or doing something. There's this natural inclination to always be making and creating. And um, we discovered that in... Uh, Tennessee with his good friend Mike Quinn we went back there and in two days with a pile of cardboard just a dumpster full of cardboard they, they built this beautiful puppet and that's what we're gonna see next right yeah, yeah. this is about just uh, this is me coming going to a, a, a boarding school down in Tennessee it's called the Webb School and my best friend in the world Mike Quinn if you go, go see the movie you'll learn more about him he's my spiritual brother in Tennessee we started off doing puppet shows together way back when he stayed in Tennessee. I went to New York City, and I, I use him as my touchstone to always go back and get rejuvenated as an artist. He always reminds me about the true spirit of art making. It's not about clients. And not, it's not about to be sexy on the streets of New York. It's not about to be better than the other guy. It's just a pure childlike sense of play. And that sounds corny, I know, especially here in the tough streets of New York. But that's another thing you got to remember as an artist. It's all about playing. If you're not playing, then you're doing something out of sync with the spirit of art. The, the spirit of art is about play. Now, I could be debated down to the ground by a lot of serious art critics and a lot of tough, bitter, embittered people that say, you know, art should be suffering, art should be an investigation into semiotics, and it should be a, a way to investigate, blah, 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 blah. Fuck all that. Let's play. Let's have fun. If you're not having fun, nobody else is going to have fun, you know? Art is, a, is, is, is about letting the spirit soar. And again, all corny shit, all true. And, that, and the, before we... That's, that, that's a big part of the, mo the, the movie and what we've been uh, receiving. We've been to 10 festivals. We premiered at South by Southwest back in March. We've been to Hot Docs and Silver Docs and Full Frame and every, all over the country. And repeatedly, people come out of the, the movie screenings and they're crying and they're laughing and they're hugging us and they're, they're saying, saying... We want our money back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm they're saying thank you for, for making a movie, a documentary, which is rare, that I can go and laugh and leave and feel good about and go home and want to make something, want to do something with myself that I've always loved doing. Like It really is not your typical doc fair. It's, it's very funny. Wayne's a really funny guy and he's very inspiring and you'll feel... Like, you'll do cartbills out of the theater, I think. Yeah, it's got this real unspooling feeling where that just keeps coming and coming, and you'll start to see as it goes how much stuff Wayne has done and how much stuff he's doing. It's really like a sensory overload in a really good way. So uh, should we run that? Absolutely. You guys did, um, I mean, in the movie, and we don't have any clips of it, but... but a moment that's amazing to me is this show you guys did for public television in uh, Chattanooga. No, in Nashville. In Nashville, Mrs. Caboose. Mrs. Kabobble's Caboose. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It, you can see it on YouTube. Yeah, it's it's amazing because w <laughs> what you kind of see is Pee Wee's Playhouse before Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah. It's crazy how mon how many elements are in that show prior to Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah, if you're at all a Pee Wee's Playhouse fan, this is the. It was the early prototype for Pee Wee's Playhouse. It was a, I was living here in New York City. I'd been here for four years, but my friend Allison Mork down in Nashville said they needed a local, a PBS station needed a local kids show to teach kids music. So I went down to Nashville, lived there for four months, built the whole thing from scratch, the puppets and the sets and everything, took it back up here to New York, took it to a place called Broadcast, took my portfolio to Broadcast Arts, and got a job on the greatest television show in the history of the universe, Pee Wee's Playhouse, all from this crappy little local PBS teaching music to kids show. I mean, great things begin in humble origins, you know? And that's another lesson of the movie. And um, you can see all the origins of Pee Wee's Playhouse in 
ham bone and, and yeah the ham bone the dog puppet later morphed into dirty dog there's a talking stove that kind of later morphed into the talking chair cherry and that's you know I can't emphasize enough. It doesn't matter where you're from or it doesn't matter what school you went to. Don't be intimidated by people throwing out all these fancy schools or the big cities they went to or the people they studied with. It doesn't matter. All you need is a heart and drive and ambition and you can climb any ladder you want to. You know, That's another message of the movie. I come from nowhere. I'm a, like a blue collar, hillbilly, redneck kid from Hickson, Tennessee, who had enough nerve to get in his 1970 Ford Maverick and drive up here to New York City, park on 23rd Street, go into the School of Visual Arts, and stalk Art Spiegelman, who was creating Mouse and the great Raw magazine, one of the great artists here of New York City. I mean, who was I? Who, you know, what nerve? You know, it's, it's all about just like... You know, we're only here for like 80 years, if you're lucky, 85 years. It, now is your time. This is your world. The world belongs to you. It don't, it, it's yours. When you're dead, you're dead. You're gone forever. So why not, you know? Why not take every risk you can think of? You've got nothing to lose because you're going to be a skeleton soon. And, and just do it, you know? Do it. Is there anything about... Yeah. Before you die, is there anything about your skeleton you want to tell us? I, I mean... want it to be made into a puppet. <laughs> I want it to be a motorized skeleton that, that, that dances a jig until it falls apart or turns into dust. And then I want the dust to be formed back into a bronze sculpture. And then I want the bronze sculpture to be shot to the moon. And then I want, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I cannot stop, you know. And I, you should not stop. Don't take no for an answer. Don't listen to people who naysay. I don't care if it's your parents or your boyfriend or your wife or your husband. Do not listen to naysayers. If you live with a naysayer or you're surrounded by naysayers, get rid of them. You know, I'm talking to you as a fellow artist, but this can apply to anything in life. You know, I am the corny, corny guy who's saying the corny things, and they're all true. Yeah. It's all there. It's all there if you just look at it. I and mean, then say, why are you saying nay? That's such a weird word to say. Who said nay? Naysayer. Oh, he said nay. Okay. You never heard the word naysayer before? <laughs> naysayer. The, the other thing I, I love about the movie is you see Wayne get stuff uh, roughed out and on its feet really fast. And I think that's another gesture, another moment, or another meaning of the movie is you don't think, just do it. Right. right? The creative act is not an act of analysis. It's an in-the-moment, pure spiritual energy thing that human beings can do. No other animal on the planet makes art except for human beings. I mean, uh, uh, other animals make beautiful structures and stuff, but it's instinctual. And maybe that's a lesson, too. Our instinct maybe is to make art, you know? Our instinct is to make objects. And it's not about analysis. It's not about education or anything else. It's this pure... Uh, force of the universe that's passed on through us. We can tap into it. Again, I know all this sounds like sentimental stuff, but it's, it's all true, you know? There's an energy out there that if you believe in it, you can tap into it. And it's not about analysis or being smarter than the next guy or wearing the right clothes or having enough money or anything like that. It's open to all of us. And this is the the perfect place for that kind of thought, right? Like, talk about taking risks and being weird and taking ideas and taking them as far as you can. I mean, that's what built places like this. I mean, come on, man. It's a miracle to be alive. You've won the, you've won the cosmic lottery. You're, a, you're, you're, you're a walking around with a consciousness, you know? Use it. You know, it's, 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 it's the perfect magic of, of the whole fucking universe. Who knows if there's any life out there besides us? You possess one of the most valuable things there is, consciousness. It can, it can do anything you want it to do. Okay, I think it's time to put away the grease gun, <laughs> Wayne. We, we're on board. Now tell us what to do next, oh, okay? I, okay? Well, do, do the I'm impression sorry. that made me... There's one impression, and if anyone's close to my age, there's a character on a TV show, and this is the one that made me say, you're that guy? And then I got to know him, and it's... Randy. Yeah. Smoking's cool, boys and girls. <laughs> yeah, Randy. I'm Randy from Pee Wee's Playhouse. I'm also Dirty Dog. 
Yeah, and also Roger the Monster. I like Paschetti, Pee Wee. Hey, do we have, do we have <laughs> any more questions, anybody? Rain, Mr. Kite. Rain, Pee Wee. It looks like rain. <laughs> and who, who saw Big Top Pee Wee? Anybody see that movie that was not so great? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm also Vance the Pig. Hey, Pee Wee, let's race. <laughs> Question in the front row. Neil, you mentioned that you uh, bought a $600 camera and off you went to produce the movie. Did your resources build from there, and how did you put that together? No. I, well, they kept making the... I love the camera. It was small. I mean, I, there was no money to make this movie, so it was me and uh, Venetian Blind. There was no lights, no crew, no one, so it, it was very intimate to have me and Wayne in a room and talk, so I kept the camera because it was so small. Like, he hardly knew it was there. And they kept making them better, so I went through three of them. And eventually we shot with an EX-1, but that was another guy, and that was his horse that, that he liked to use. Um, but it was a great camera. I actually was at the LA Film Festival, and they had them all laid out, all their nice Canon 5Ds and all that. And they said, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for the camera that I shot my movie that's in the LA Film Festival with. And he goes, really, which one? And I said, the Canon Vixia. And he looked at me, like, disgusted, and he goes, what? You shot your... Wait, and people are going to look at it in the... F oh, dear. And he was he was not happy. And I said, no, it looks great. You know, come see it. And eventually they warmed up to it. But yeah, no, that I love that camera. Um, and I highly, highly recommend anyone going to make a movie or anything that goes and gets one right now. Next question to the left in front of you. I'm just uh, curious about the filmmaking process. And, you know, Wayne, as an artist and a creative yourself, did you find yourself having to let go a little bit of control so that Neil could, you know, narrate the story and carve it. And then, Neil, did you find, did you find it difficult to work with a fellow artist in, in, you know, creating the documentary, or was it more collaborative? I'll go, uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, the one thing is, and I, I, and I t like, again, my first movie, and I tell people this, and they're, they're shocked by it. Um, there, he was not in the edit bay. He ne I, I would go there every day and say, will you do this? Will you do this? And he never said no. He would do anything I asked and talk about anything I asked to talk about. Um, there's a scene in the movie where he builds an LBJ puppet head with his son and eventually wears a suit. And we, we walk two miles up this hill, and he dances around the Hollywood Hills wearing this big, cumbersome L uh, LBJ puppet head, which will be at IFC Center on Friday night. Um, and it was amazing. He never said no and would do anything. So I had, I had the, 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 the best a, a director could ask for. Well, and I did not uh, it, uh, insert myself into the filmmaking process at all. You know, I did not want to see daily footage, mainly because I didn't want to become self-conscious. When I start looking at myself too much, it kills the, the moment. It kills the spirit. Plus, I, I practice the uh, artist's golden rule. Uh, when I work with a, a fellow artist and I collaborate with them, I want to be, I want to treat, I'll treat them like I want to be treated, you know. I wouldn't want Neil hanging over my shoulder telling me how to make a painting, and I certainly wasn't going to hang over his shoulder telling him how to make a film. Now again, that goes back to risk taking. That's a risky move to make, you know, putting your life and your life story in the hands of somebody and hoping it comes out okay, but I did because I think that was the only approach that's feasible. You know, if I had gotten involved in it, my ego would have been like control. Oh, make me look better here. Oh, uh, you know, I trusted his instincts. And I crossed my fingers, and uh, I didn't see it till it premiered at the South by Southwest Film Festival in Austin with a crowd of people. And uh, luckily, it came out great. Of course, it could have gone south. It could have been bad. I could have been mad. I could have sued. Or it could have it been all kinds of darkness going on, but it didn't. Uh, and, and that risk taking has gotten me into a lot of trouble in my career. I have, I have taken risks that d do not pay off and it's been, it's been bad news. But that's, that's the liabilities of being an artist, of being a real artist, you know, what I think a real artist is. Was, was there any, any part of your story that you kind of didn't see until this m movie came out, like that wasn't clear to you or came out? Well, I guess I didn't think I was going to be so um, inspirational to people. I never once thought I was an inspirational type of person. I never once thought I would get up here and get this, the grease gun going, as you call it. But I can't help myself. I get up in front of people, and I feel uh, a need to like pour my soul out. I know it's a bit embarrassing, 
and that's part of the what that's part of uh, the title of the movie. Putting yourself out there on the line is an embarrassing thing. Uh, putting your emotions on the line is a very embarrassing thing, especially in our culture, especially for men. We're told, to, you know, to be the strong, silent type. We're told not to uh, show so much emotions. You know, we're supposed to be like these rigid, hard guys. You know, and it's embarrassing. And, and emotion is truth, and truth is beauty, and beauty is embarrassing. Yeah, I mean, Neil will attest to this when you get to know Wayne. He kind of draws you in to uh, your kind of creative self. Like I, this happened to me. I got to go up and visit Wayne's house, and I was just kind of thinking I'd go up there and try to scam him out of a painting <laughs> or trade him like a robot for a painting. And Which next will thing happen. I know, we were like draw. He, we were we drawing were drawing with each other and started co cooking up stuff. And so th it. it I mean, the show side of Wayne is this emphatic, like you, you know, the story of creativity and encouraging people. But in real life, it just happens around him. And when you're around him, I think that's kind of w what I experienced too. And that's what I got me so excited about getting to know him and working with him. Yeah, you definitely, you see like the work ethic and the drive to create. And that does rub off, absolutely. And it makes you want to do more and more. Like if you see this person who's willing to, to really go for it and put themselves out there, you kind of think, okay, well, I'll put myself out there. If he'll do it, if he trusts me to, to do that, then I should go along with him. You know, I, I'll, I'll push that. Uh, that makes me think too, just emotionally, kind of like what, what's happening. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I mean... Y y we get to talk every now and then and you it's kind of like we take each other's temperature and like it there's a lot of feelings involved with this with doing these kind of things it it's not always really pleasant no. doing it so i mean i mean I th could you talk about that a little bit well first of all being in the public eye like this having the movie out there led me to joel and i've been a huge admirer of if you don't are familiar with Joel Hodgson's work? Please look it up on the in, on the net. He's done so many amazing creative things. He's been a, a performer since the early '80s. He was a great stand-up comic. I don't know if you still do stand-up. He, uh, he's a stand-up comic. He's a magician. He's a ventriloquist. He's the creator of some of the most amazing TV shows around, and of course, the great mystery science theater. If you don't uh, familiar with that, please check it out. And that's what being this movie is a gift. You're a gift to me the, to meet you. You know, I've admired you for so many years, and you've become our friend, my friend. And we're going to do a uh, do projects together. And I think that spirit. That I'm sorry, I forgot what the question. Well, was. listen, no, you should be moderating this. Now that I think about <laughs> it, you should have come out first. No, 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 <laughs> no. I mean, it's it's. One thing leads to another, you know, when you start creating and put yourself out there. Like I said, I put stuff out there. I do, the, I do it for, for the love of it. I do it for the passion of it. And it attracts people like Joel. And now we're going to get together and, do, and, and, and hopefully multiply that kind of passion and put our two resources together. It, it, leads nothing, it, it leads to great things when you really show the world your love of life, you know. And that's what art is. It's about the love of life. Uh, right here in the front row center. Two questions, actually. Um, you brought up Spiegelman before. And I was just wondering what your influences were when you were getting started. Obviously, it might have led to working with Gary Panner, but the DIY, maybe Art Chantry or something like that. And then, s secondly, unrelated probably, but your work's highly interactive with puppetry and things. And I'm wondering how you see that translating for your work to go digital. Well, um, first of all, my early influences as a kid were cartoonists. You know, that's what I originally, that was my original idea of what an artist was, was a cartoonist. And I loved Mad Magazine. You know, I think that's what eventually one of the things, and Mad Magazine was all about the great tradition of Jewish humor coming out of New York City. You know, Mort Drucker, uh, 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 Jack Davis, Al Jaffe, uh, all the great mad artists, Harvey Kurtzman, of course. That's, that was a big influence on me. And then as I matured, I loved underground comics. Robert Crumb was a big influence. I love uh, Ralph Steadman, the illustrator. Uh, I, and then, uh, of course, I love the history of painting, and the list goes on and on. I could list names forever. Uh, so 
I'm a humble student of art history, and I love cartooning. Any kind of cartoonist interests me. As far as like the digital world, that's something I've dipped my toe in a little bit. I've done a lot of animation on computers. The first computer I ever had was a Commodore Amiga, you know, and I used a program called Deluxe Paint 4, and I did all the animation on Beekman's World with that crappy computer and that crappy program, yet it was broadcast on CBS all across the world, you know. You don't need fancy equipment. You don't need a lot of technology to create something. And then I went on later to use uh, Illustrator and After Effects. And I love animation. I love the fact that the computer makes animation accessible and easy to, easier to do than ever before. So I, I think of digital, I think of animation. And as far as collaborative anim, uh, kind of stuff, I still like just plain old, old-fashioned puppet shows and, and live stuff and very, very crude um, uh, technologies. But uh, I love the computer for animation, and, and I hope to do a, a, a lot more uh, animation and stuff on the computer with Neil, Neil's company. Actually, at the very end of the movie, the end credits show a kind of collaboration with Neil and Wayne, where Wayne designed the animation, and it's computer-generated. It's really cool. Yeah, I own a uh, motion graphics company, and um, we, did, we did all the animation in the movie. You saw a little bit of it, but at the end, there's these end credits that we made and sort of a way to not get uh, let Wayne see the movie I said okay well I'll let you get your hands on this and he drew all the characters and beautiful backgrounds and got all the colors and textures right and it really is I'm very very that's the thing I'm most proud of as far as animation goes in the movie it really is uh, spectacular and one of my favorite things about the movie just kind of the, the the thing that struck me so much about Wayne and his emotionally where he's at was in college when other guys were like picking up guitars and playing parties with their bands, Wayne was setting up puppet stages and putting on these like punk rock puppet shows and that, that's kind of how he got girls. Uh, no, the girls didn't like it at oh, all actually. They don't like the puppets, I see. Well, a certain kind of girl did, but you know, I like nerd girls. All right, guys, join me one more time in thanking tonight's guests, Wayne White, Neil Berkeley, and tonight's moderator, Joel Hodgson. Thank you so much. Tell everybody.